Welcome to our latest theatrical experiment in the series we call the 3x3 Three Three Online Theater Challenge. I'm Betty Mitchell for Rough Magic Shakespeare Company, and our tech wizard making the magic happen is the marvelous Mike Palo. Our purpose is threefold, to allow theater artists, playwrights, directors, and actors to keep their skills sharp and creative juices flowing, and continue doing live performances that are their life's blood during this unprecedented time in a world where live in-person theater has been indefinitely suspended. And to give you theater lovers the new live explorations of the human experience that have been a foundation of human civilization as long as there have been humans. That's right, we said it. Save live theater, save the world. You can get involved. Follow Rough Magic Shakespeare Company on Facebook to find requests for audience prompts to challenge our playwrights and to be among the first to know about upcoming events. If you are an actor, director, or playwright, get in touch to get involved. Check out um, our YouTube channel where you can see all of our um, events. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. That will help us so much in our quest for sponsors. And of course, to support our theater artists in these challenging times and bring more live theater events like these to life, please donate at paypal.me slash roughmagicshakes. You can find that link on our Facebook posts, YouTube and our YouTube video descriptions. Every dollar helps. Tonight's event, Reach, original short works by Christopher Lockhart. They say our reach must always exceed our grasp. And now, as company member Bo Wade says, at a time when we're forced apart, it can feel like we're reaching out for human connections with more than usual uncertainty as to whether our grasp will ever be achieved. Each of tonight's pieces experiments with characters reaching for that connection or finding themselves in the far reaches of the human experience. Christopher Lockhart was our first ever featured playwright. The very first festival of original short works that Rough Magic Shakespeare Company ever did in the year of our founding was a collection of his short plays that we called Locking Hearts. His plays have been produced over 200 times worldwide, and his um, work has been included in 10 anthologies, including four volumes of Smith and Krause's best 10 minute plays of the year. His engagingly off kilter sensibility continues to be a favorite of our company, and we are overjoyed to explore a whole new collection of his wide wandering work. First up is an homage to the modern classic Waiting for Godot. It's Dano Waddell and Bo Wade in Didi and Gogo Walk the Grounds, directed by Marissa Glidden. Dano Waddell is a Palm Coast based actor and improvateur. During the lockdown, he's been spending time with his two daughters and writing and recording some new songs as well as rapidly becoming an honored member of our small but courageous legion of theatrical superheroes. Our original theatrical man of steel, Bo Wade, is a Daytona area based actor, director, and playwright, and the first to hold all three of these positions in a three by three event. Marissa Glidden caps off this threesome of theatrical super friends as she continues to grow and stretch her directorial skills and vision. And now, they are still waiting. Here's Dee Dee and Do Go Go Walk the Grounds. It's cloud thou, miss. Go Go, I said it's clouds, I'll miss. Clouds. Yes, clouds. 
I will miss them. Hmm. You know, it's hard. It's kind of odd because, you know, they're really hard to miss. From this position, that's all they, you can see. They dominate the view. I mean, even standing, they still hog half the vista. Unless you're standing at a lakeside, then it's full dominance once again. Still, I'll miss them. Don't go. I said, still, I'll miss them. The clouds. Yes, the clouds. I shall miss them for two reasons. First, they have always taken me by surprise. I'll be going about my business, head down, gaze rigid, eyes soaking in the vital details, and then a straight tilt of my chin and clouds. They were there the whole time. Yes. The second reason I shall miss them is that clouds have never demanded a decision from me. Explain, Dee Dee. Everything in the world demands a decision. A woman walks by. Shall I marry her? A tree looms. Shall I cut it down to for fuel my winter fire? A mountain beckons. Shall I bore a tunnel through its heart so to subjugate the people on the other side who so naively trusted its inviolability? Difficult. Exactly. Everywhere my eye rests, difficult decisions offering nothing but difficulties. So that is why I've always found comfort in looking at the clouds. No matter what my ambitions, no matter what my appetites, the clouds are forever above them. They are impervious to my designs. They are beyond my reach. Reach. Why do they do this to us, Dee Dee? For our own good, they say. Every morning I think, maybe they will miscalculate. Maybe they will misjudge. But no, always just out of reach. Maddening. Is the lawn marked, perhaps? Have we left permanent impressions in the grass that betray our dimensions? I have not noticed. I plot at night, you know. I cannot sleep, so why not plot? Example, Gogo. Well, for instance, if I were to skip my meals for a day, would I not be lighter? And being lighter, might that not throw off the judgment of my bearers? For performing the same task day in and day out for, for forever. Have they not become little more than automatons? And being automatons, are they not a slave to a regularity of output? An exact effort rendered exactly. Alter their calculations of exertion by a meter ounce or two, perhaps even, perhaps even a pound or more if despair extends my fast. They might carry me a few feet farther than instructed. Place me thus at last in reach of you. Reach! <sighs> it's they who have done this to us. For our own good, they say. What do they know of good? They call themselves nurses. And do we believe them? Do we not? No, no. We do. They have nursed us. You have to give them credit there. We were at the brink. Your foot? Your head? Dangerously close to packing it in. Perhaps. What? Nothing. A close shave. When they found me in that ditch. That's where you'll find him, I said. It was still not morning. I'd spent the pitch black night tormented by hunger, fingering a, a hard object in my pocket, 
I'm trying to remember if it was a turnip or a stone. Why did you not bite it to find out? Well, if I bit it and it was a turnip, I would be saved from starvation. But if I bit it and it were a stone, I would be doomed to such by the ruin of my last teeth. It's decisions that make living unbearable. Well, perhaps. What? Nothing. Well, at least decisions can no longer plague us. When it's time for us to wake, they wake us. They feed us when it's time for us to eat. They bring us out onto the grounds when it's time for us to breathe the air and feel the sun. And when will it be time for us to be together again, Dee Dee? I'll ask them when they come to bring us in. Every day you say you will ask them and you always forget. Today I will remember, and if not, tomorrow. Go, go, I said today I will remember, and if not, tomorrow. Go, go! Mm -hmm. Did you close your eyes? Did I? You know you cannot close your eyes. If you close your eyes, you'll sleep, and if you sleep, you'll dream. I cannot keep them open, though. They are so heavy. Come. Do as I do. There. Now, when you think you're closing your eyes, you'll be opening them instead. The blood rushes to my head. It is very pleasurable. I do not like it. It roars in my ears. What? I said it roars in my ears. Oh, yes, and, and very many more to you, too. Gogo? Yes, Dee Dee? This is an odd perspective, Gogo. Yes. You appear completely natural to me. Yes. But the world is turned upside down. That is what I see every time I look at you, Dee Dee. You will ask the nurses, Dee Dee. Yes. When we can be together again. Yes. A and you won't forget it. No. Okay. It's good to look at you, Gogo. -Go. It's good to look at you, Dee Dee. I like the world like this. Yes, it is very... Pleasurable. Except. Yes, Dee Dee. I miss the clouds, Go Go. Reach. That was Dano Waddell and Bo Wade in Dee Dee and Go Go Walk the Grounds. Next up is Photos of Meg with Bethany Stillian, directed by Bo Wade. My dear friend Bethany is co founder of Rough Magic Shakespeare Company, an original schemer of the nefarious plan for the 3x3 series. So if you have issue with it, um, no, actually, don't take it up with her. She's a little busy right now. Um, now based in Daytona, she frantically juggles, supporting her aging parents, caring for a menagerie of high maintenance critters, and keeping live theater alive. Here is photos of Meg.
summer. <laughs> well, spring, I suppose it's late May, but hot. Hot enough to put the sprinkler out. Meg standing under it, head back, mouth open to catch the drops. <laughs> Her bathing suit is too small. It's from the previous summer, a one piece. I tell her, it's too small for you now, sweetie. It won't fit now. <laughs> She's waited all winter to wear it outside. She counts and fusses until I let her put it on. <laughs> oh. The straps look like they're gonna cut off her arms. <laughs> her smile is a mile wide. It's summer, mommy. It's summer. <laughs> Still summer. Really summer now. It's August. The raspberries aren't ripe yet. But Meg can't wait. She's pushing her way through the patch, trying to find one ripe berry in the middle of all those green berries. She's holding up a leaf, peeking underneath, tongue between her teeth. <laughs> she doesn't find one ripe raspberry. <laughs> By the end of the month, we're picking a pint a day. Everybody on the street gets a visit from Meg. Knocking, knocking, knocking on the door with a Tupperware full of raspberries. <laughs> the girls play playing fort. Carl's taken all the cushions off of the couch and the chairs and piled them, stacked them, leaned them up against each other. He... Meg, looking out from inside, smiling, but her cheeks are wet. Lizzie made her cry. Make her stop, mommy. Lizzie keeps knocking the fort down. I tell her, is she just a baby? She doesn't know. Meg asks, did I knock down the floors when I was a baby? I know. I'm sorry, she said. Sorry. Sorry, Carl. Carl disapproves. That's <laughs> what he said. I disapprove of this, Maggie. <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> Me too. I disapprove of this too, Carl. <laughs> Stop laughing. <laughs> you to carry me to bed. Me laughing. I can't stop. <laughs> I laughed until I passed out, I think. I think I laughed in my sleep. <sighs> Lizzie doesn't understand, he says now. Lizzie. Doesn't understand. <sighs> mm. Birthday party. Thanks. Pointing at the cake on the kitchen counter. Chocolate. 
chocolate. Chocolate and everything. She helped me make it. I helped mommy make it. Pointing. She sifted the flour. Crack that. Crack Are you just exploited to her, Carl? You understand everything. Everything that happens, everything has a reason, right? There's reasons for everything. Everything that happens, you you make her understand, Carl. Make us all understand. Eight. Buried in the sand, she's shouting at the seagulls to stay away from her cooking. <laughs> Sleeping, feet on the pillow, head covered with stuffed animals. On Carl's shoulders, screaming, laughing, screaming. It's hard, Maggie. It's too hard, he says. I can't do it. I can't remember her like that, like you. It's too, it's too hard. <laughs> hard. Of course it's hard. It's all hard. Two in the morning, stitches, fevers, puke on the bed. It's all hard, Carl. Kids are hard. But you do it. Two in the morning, puke on the bed. You do it. It's, you do anything. You're a kid. You... dress. The first day of kindergarten. Carl's taking her. I want to go, but Maggie, Lizzie has a fever. I'll stay home with her, Mag. No, she's sick, Carl. She needs... Carl's taking me. Meg. Back on the front step. Periwinkle dress. We're gonna be like back on the front step. Oh, we can get kids. It's killing you, you know. <laughs> it's killing you. You know. Yeah. 
only way. <laughs> it's the only way I can do it. The only way. Lizzie. Lizzie. Lizzie has you, girl. Lizzie has. Who does Meg have? Me. I'm the only one she has. I'm the only. I'm the only one, girl. Nobody else wants to. Nobody else can. Nobody else will remember! <laughs> Take a picture of me, mommy. Take a picture of me being brave. She's hiking her skirt up over her knee and bent over hair hanging down and she's pointing to the band-aid on her knees soaked through and red. There's stitches hurt, mommy. Oh, you don't need stitches. Daddy says stitches. Carl always said stitches. He was right. I have stitches. She was so brave. Will you hold me, Mommy? When I get the stitches? Yes, Angel. Will you squeeze me, Mommy? If it starts to hurt. Yes, Angel. How hard, Mommy? Hard, Angel. How hard, Mommy? So hard. <laughs> so hard. Bethany Stillian in Photos of Meg. Hold on to your hats now for one man, two parties with Brent Jordan and Bo Way. When we challenged Christopher Lockhart to accept our challenge to write three new pieces from audience provided prompts, he saw our challenge and raised us above and beyond. There's something I always wanted to do, he said, but nobody's ever been up for trying it. It's a branching monologue where a random event at the end of each line will decide what the next line will be. What? Well, this is the online theater challenge. In for a penny, in for one man, two parties. Two parties, one man. We shall let fate sort it out. If I get this card in, I will go to Giggy's Wiffle Ball Kegger. If I miss, I will go to Aunt Mitz's Lake House Barbecue. Oh, joy. Welcome to another episode of Sunburnt Family Feud. 
All right, how am I going to get through this with both my sanity and my place in Graham Graham's will intact? <laughs> if I get this card in, I'll hang out at the rope swing with the cousins. If I miss, I'll go out on the pontoon boat with Uncle Algy. Trouble is, Uncle Algy hates family parties even more than I do. Every year, Aunt Mitz pesters him to take everyone out on a boat ride. So he says he needs to take a short putt around to test the ballast. Then he smuggles a cooler of Mick Light and his Sony portable on board and disappears to the other side of the lake for 12 hours. If I get this card in, I'll stow away by hiding under the boat cover while he's filling his cooler. If I miss, I'll get in good with Graham Graham by hiding the portable TV behind the barbecue pit and hurting all the ants on board while Unky, Uncle Algie is looking for it. Come on, Aunt Mitz. Come on, Aunt Gertie, Aunt Lizabelle, and Aunt Em. Uncle Algie's taking us all for a ride. That's funny. That's not what happened last time. Aunt Mitz will giggle while Aunt Em gives Uncle Algie the double bird, and Aunt Gertie thrusts a meaty hand into the cooler. Uncle Algie won't be too upset with me, though, because he's got a secret thing for Aunt Lizabelle. If I get this card in, I'll do Uncle Algie a solid by chatting up Aunt Mitzi to keep her distracted. If I miss, I'll chant up on Elizabeth myself, because she is fine. Permission to take the helm, Captain, I'll say as I snap him a salute. Then, after he sits by Aunt Elizabeth, I'll steer the pontoon over to Tycoon Bay so Mitz can make fun of the rich people's houses. If I get this card in, I'll cruise by Reinhardt Mansion so she can bark at the 30-foot gold-plated poodle statue. If I miss, I'll buzz the shore of egalitarian estates so she can spit at the tomb of the unknown hedge fund manager. No, ma'am. Uncle Algie's not up to anything in the stern. Look over there. They put new disco balls in Fifi's collar. <laughs> well, the cards have spoken. The deeds of the day have been determined by destiny. I depart now in step with the decrees of fate. <sighs> that was Britt Jordan and his inner voice, Bo Wade, in One Man, Two Parties. Still on the subject of social events, it's Sunday Dinner with Dana Waddell and Marissa Glidden, directed by Bo Wade. Get-togethers Lockhart style always bring the unexpected, whether parties with friends, family barbecues, or Sunday dinner. Johnny, Johnny, where's my Johnny, 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 there he is. Four drinks, Johnny. That's no good. Johnny, Johnny, what's the problem? Johnny, Johnny, tell me, please. What about the weekend? About Sunday dinner? Starting a little early this week. Johnny, take me with you. Take your Ellie. Don't try to do it alone. It wrecks you every time. At least try to... Let me come and pick you up afterwards so you don't have to sleep it off there. <sighs> Sorry. It just really drives me crazy when that happens and I just know you can't stand another minute there. 
Johnny, Johnny, can you see me? Johnny, Johnny, I'm right here. What's this one? I've never seen you drink that before. Try it. Oh, medicine-y. It's a Manhattan. Two parts rye, one part vermouth, sweet, and a dash of bitters. Ugh, bitters is right. My dad will be working on his second one whenever I walk in. He'll still be sucking on the cherry from the first one, the stem poking out of his mouth. He doesn't bother with the orange peel or the cocktail glass. He just pours the wild turkey into a tumbler with ice, throws in the vermouth, he likes it dry, and then flicks in the bitters. For the first couple of refills, he spits the cherry out into the sink and adds a new one from the jar. By the fourth or fifth though, he just leans over the glass, lining up his shot like a bombardier and then just lets it flop into the glass. If he makes the shot, he cackles. If he misses, he swears and grabs for it. Most of the time, it hits off the edge of the glass, tumbles over the counter, and onto the floor. He drops down to his hands and knees and crawls after it. My sister's kids squeal, and they start chasing it after her with him, crawling under the table, racing for it and crushing it under their clumsy palms. Eventually, he gets tired of this game and does away with the cherry entirely. The kids don't like that, though. They crowd around him at the counter, begging for him to drop the cherry bomb. He tries to shoo him away, but they just start jumping up and down, cheering, cherry bomb, cherry bomb. He grabs his glass, pushes through the mob, stumbles downstairs into his study, and slams the door. Doesn't come back out until everyone's gone home. What about this one? Try it. <laughs> Fizzy. Jameson and Ginger. My mom has an exact recipe for making them. First, five ice cubes. Always five. <laughs> you can actually see her lips move as she counts them out. Then, five pours of whiskey. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Five. <laughs> and then uh, one of those little cans, the eight ounce cans of Canada Dry. You can't believe how excited she was when they came out with those little cans. Before, she was always complaining about how she had to throw out the extra soda that wouldn't fit in the glass. I'd say, use three ice cubes instead of five, Mom. All the soda will fit. But nope, it has to be five. Now with the little cans, nothing goes to waste. <laughs> except the cans. Shit. On Sundays, it's like the whole house is made out of Canada dry cans. <laughs> they got a waste basket in the kitchen for the recyclables, but she doesn't like anyone looking in it and counting how many she's gone through. So every time one of my sister's kids comes running through, she pops a can of soda in their hands. She figures you won't be able to tell the kids' cans from her cans when you look in the basket. But the kids never throw their cans in the basket. <laughs> they just take a sip and leave it on the counter or the table or the coffee table or the bookcase. My dad's bald head for Christ's sake. So my mom's got to run through the house picking up these cans, emptying them out in the sink before throwing them in the waste basket. She's pouring 10 bucks of soda down that drain every Sunday and it ain't even four o'clock before my dad's got to drag that basket full of cans to the garage to empty it. Weights in? Try it. Weights in. She brings a box of it with her on Sundays, my sister. The box starts off in the fridge. My mom saves her space, uh, space on one of the shelves for it. My sister doesn't like to let her glass go empty, or even half. So she'll keep getting up from the kitchen table, opening the fridge door and topping it off from the box. Her husband will come in and peek on her, you know, he, me and him will be in the living room drinking beer, watching a game. He'll get up, walk over to the kitchen, pop his head around the corner and see what she's up to. He'll see her glass and say, is that a new one? 
she'll get all offended and, and say, it's the same glass. Stop spying on me and leave me alone. So he'll stomp back off to the couch, mumbling under his breath like, bullshit, that's the same glass. I hear that fridge opening and closing. She's going to get plastered, and I'm going to have to do the driving on the way back, even though I did it coming up. Eventually, my sister gets tired of opening the fridge, and my mom complaining about wasting the cold and the electricity, so she'll move the box from the fridge to the counter. Then she'll get tired of getting up from the table, so she'll move it right beside her. And she will sit at that table with my mom for hours, topping that glass off every five minutes, bitching about how her husband never helps and her kids never let up and her boss never lets her breathe for one second. Well, what about this one? Try it. <laughs> Stop Dr. Pepper. Who the hell in your family drinks Dr. Pepper? I do. <laughs> my Johnny? No, 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 no. Not my Johnny. My Johnny drinks Bud Limes and Corona Lights and the occasional Stella when he's trying to impress a pretty bartender. But never Dr. Pepper. Not my Johnny. You're right. Uh, I've never sipped a Dr. Pepper before. <laughs> but Ellie, my Ellie... I will drink this Dr. Pepper and drink nothing but Dr. Pepper. If you will go to Sunday dinner with me this weekend and next weekend and every other rotten weekend until we finally have our own family and our own Sundays and our own dinners and we can tell everyone else in the world to fuck off <laughs> because you and me, we're going to do it right. Or die sober trying. Do you promise? Yeah. And here's to you, Ellie. My <laughs> Ellie. <laughs> here's to us, Johnny. My Johnny. Here's to us. Jenna Waddell and Marissa Glidden in Sunday Dinner. Hat, hold it. It's one man, two parties, redux. Originally from Connecticut, Brent Jordan is based now in Deland, Florida. Brent recently worked on stage with Bethany in Positively Florida's production of The Humans and with Bo in City Rep's Romeo and Juliet. During the lockdown, he tells us, he's finally been able to catch up on some reading always interested in trying new things. He said he's very interested to participate in this three by three event, and we are overjoyed to have him join us. And now, here we go again. One man, two parties. Two parties, one man. We shall let fate sort it out. If I get this card in, I will go to Giggy's Waffle Ball Kegger. If I miss, I will go to Aunt Mitz's Lake House Barbecue. If a ball kegger, yes. Okay, fate is with me. We're going to let it ride. If I get this card in, I will man up and I'll ask Alicia to be on my team. If I miss, I will, ugh, I will team up with Jackie. If she asks, uh, who am I kidding? She always asks. Not Jackie. She is the worst wiffle ball player in the universe, except for Alicia. 
and Jackie's going to keep trying to drag me to the rec room to make out with her, which Alicia would never do. Man, I have got the worst luck. Time to change it. If I get this card in, I'll tell Jackie that Giggy has the hots for her, so she should stop macking on me and hit him up. If I miss, I will tell Giggy, sorry, bro. Jackie desperately wants to uh, bear my brood. What can I do? Oh, man, Jackie having my kids. That's a scary thought. But, I mean, is it time to start getting serious about Jackie? We haven't been doing the enemies with benefits thing forever. Maybe it's time we grew up and took on some responsibility. Huh. If I get this card in, I'll listen to my mom's advice and sit Jackie down for a serious discussion about our future. If I miss, I'll listen to my dad's advice and keep waiting for Alicia to get desperate or drunk enough to get it on with me. Stupid mom. Fine. If I get this card in, I will listen to my mom's advice to accept what my dad finally came to accept when he proposed to her after eight years of dating. That eventually in every man's life comes the time to give up the Peter Pan dream of staying a little boy forever. If I miss, I'll listen to my dad's advice. Second star to the right and straight on till morning. You the man, Dad. I have your back if you got mine. The cards have spoken. The deeds of the day have been determined by destiny. I depart now in step with the decrees of fate. <sighs> that was Brent Jordan and Bo Way wandering a new time loop in One Man, Two Parties. Speaking of time, next is 553 with Bethany Stillian and Tom Meredith, directed by Marissa Glidden. Tom has been with us from our very first 3x3, three three, and we're so glad to have him join us again tonight. A Daytona-based actor, Tom's work for us has ranged from the severe to the silly without a misstep. Let's see if his character, Lionel, can say the same at this hour of the night. It's 5.53. Lionel. 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 Oh, no, what? What? Turn off the alarm. All right. Okay. Got it. Lionel. Lionel. Lionel! Oh, mm, what? Please turn off the alarm. Oh, okay, okay. Wait. What alarm? The alarm! The clock alarm. Please turn it off. The alarm clock? Yes. Is the alarm clock going off? No. Oh. Good. Lionel? Lionel? Lionel! What? For the third time, please shut off the alarm clock. Joyce, the alarm clock is not going off. 
Yes, but it will. Not until 5.53. That's not for another seven minutes. I don't want it to go off at all. You didn't want the alarm to go off. Why did you ask me 13 times last night if I'd remembered to set it? So we wouldn't oversleep. Fine. Go back to sleep and in seven minutes, I'll, the alarm will go off and I'll get out of this cozy, toasty bed and pat across the hard, frozen floor, turn off the alarm and tiptoe my way back to the bed, lean over and softly whisper in your ear, Joyce, sweetheart, angel cake, time to wakey wakey. But I'll already be awake because the horrible alarm will have gone off. You're already awake now. Exactly. <sighs> I'm confused. I hate the sound of the alarm clock. You know that. You're supposed to hate the sound of the alarm clock. If you like the sound of the alarm clock, there'd be no incentive to get out of the cozy, toasty bed and pad across the hard, frozen floor to turn it off. Luckily, I don't have to get out of a warm bed. That's your job. And remind me again why it's my job. Because it's on your side of the bed. Oh. All right. <sighs> Oh, uh, Lionel, what are you doing? Switching sides. Scoot oh, over. Get back over. Get, this is my side. Get back. Get okay, back. okay. Sheesh. The alarm clock is on your side of the bed because you are the man. And it is the man's job to turn off the alarm in the morning. Now hurry up because you only have five minutes. Four minutes. Well, four minutes to do your job. And remind me again what being a man has to do with switching off an alarm clock. It's, it's a dangerous job. Turning off the alarm? Sometimes, yes. And how could turning off the alarm be dangerous? Well, well it's dark. You could trip over something. Trip over what? It wasn't anything to trip over last night when I walked from the alarm clock to the bed after turning the stupid thing on. Something might have appeared overnight. Appeared? What, what, from out of nowhere? What could possibly have magically materialized on our bedroom floor in the middle of the night? A burglar. A burglar? Yes, a, a burglar. He, he could have broken into the house in the middle of the night and is now lying on the dark bedroom floor waiting for one of us to get up to turn off the alarm. So he could burgle us. Maybe. In the middle of our bedroom. Maybe. Jumping up from the floor, brandishing a gun and yelling, give me your wallet, this is a bedroom burglary. Maybe. And do you think he'll be disappointed when I tell him I left my wallet in my other pajamas? <sighs> Fine. Spiders. What? Spiders. Maybe in the middle of the night, a nest of spiders formed on the floor between the bed and the alarm clock. A thick, teeming nest of spiders, all hairy and crawling and venomous and waiting to feast on whatever foot fumbles into their midst. That's why it's a man's job, spiders. Now will you please turn off the alarm? No way! Lionel! Are you crazy? Hey, not on your life! I'm never stepping out of this bed again! Lionel! Jesus! Spiders every goddamn where! Oh! Lionel, there are no spiders. Oh, I can hear them. Listen. Oh, Lionel! There are no spiders between the bed and the alarm clock. Then I guess you don't need me to turn it off. Oh, Lionel. Lionel, will you please? Turn off the alarm for me, please. What about the burglar spiders? Oh, Lionel, you know I hate that stupid alarm and it's gonna go off in four minutes. Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. How am I supposed to do the math when you have the alarm set to such a weird number? Why not set it for six o'clock instead of 553? Because six o'clock isn't a good wake up number. It's too round. What? Six o'clock's a bad number. It's too soothing and familiar. 
you wake up, you look at the clock and you go, oh, look, it's six o'clock. Nice. And then you fall right back to sleep. But 553 is a very jarring number. You wake up and you go, 553? What kind of number is that? Am I late? Did I oversleep? Is it the middle of the night? What's going on? 553 is a very, it's a very alarming number. Don't you think? I, if you don't get up and turn off that stupid alarm right now, I don't know what I'm gonna do! Wait, I do know what I'm going to do. Oh yeah? And what are you gonna do? I'm gonna what are you doing? Hey, what? <laughs> hey, hey, no tickling! Are you gonna turn off the alarm? Oh, oh no, please, please stop! Are you gonna turn off the alarm? <laughs> oh, wait, please stop, I'm gonna wet myself! <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, 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 I'll turn it off, I'll turn it off! <laughs> I so love it when you finally get around to saying yes. You do, do you? I do. Well, uh, how about returning the favor? Oh, <laughs> no. No? Well, I don't know. No? I know. My <laughs> alarm is going to go off in one minute. I don't know. I don't know. Yes! <laughs> oh, yes! Oh, oh no! No! Uh! Lionel, turn it off! Get off me and turn it off! But... Quit, get off and turn it off! Now get up! Get up! Oh. Lionel? Are you okay? Lionel? Are you okay? Lionel? What? Oh. Oh. Will you shut up? I can't even hear him. Lionel, are you okay? Five fifty three with Bethany Stillian and Tom Meredith. Time and time and time again. One more time, one man, two parties. Two parties, one man. We shall let fate sort it out. If I get this card in, I will go to Giggy's Waffle Ball Kicker. If I miss, I'll go to Aunt Mitz's Lake House Barbecue. Oh, joy. Welcome to another episode of Sunburnt Family Feud. All right, how am I going to get through this with both my sanity and my place in Graham Graham's will intact. If I get this card in, I'll hang out at the rope swing with the cousins. If I miss, I'll go out on the pontoon boat with Uncle Algy. Okay, not bad, not bad. A chance for redemption after last year's indecent exposure episode. <laughs> I still don't know how the drawstring of my trunks get tied around the rope, but Lucas was laughing a little too hard for my liking. Stupid punk kid. Maybe it's time for some retribution. If I get this card in, I will challenge Lucas to a rope swing backflip contest. If I miss, I'll stay off the rope and just go inner tubing instead. 
Much less chance for accidental nudity on an inner tube. And way safer, too. Except for the snapping turtles, see? Papa says the older and bigger they become, the more nearsighted they get. And kids' toes wriggling in the water look exactly like pale little minnows to them. And so they swim up beneath you with a razor-sharp beak stretched open and, okay, stop, stop getting freaked out by the stupid snapping turtles. No one's ever even seen a snapping turtle in the lake except Papa. And Graham Graham says he's so full of it, she's going to sell him to the butcher as soon as bologna hits two bucks a pound. Okay, time to get to the bottom of this. If I get this card in, I'm going to demand Papa fess up about whether he's ever really seen a snapping turtle in the lake. If I miss, I'll bring my mask and snorkel and hunt for the underwater nest that Papa swears is right under the rope swing. Yikes. Uh, all right, I'm going to need to stock up for this mission with the right gear. But hold on, is this going to be a scientific mission to document the existence of the snapping turtles? Or is it going to be a military mission to eradicate this toe-eating menace once and for all? Huh. If I get this card in, I'll bring an underwater camera and a bag of gummy worms to lure my quarry from out of his lair. If I miss, I'll bring a 50,000 volt stun gun, a concussion grenade, and a spear gun, ooh, with an explosive tip. That's all on aisle 10 at Walmart, if I remember correctly. All right, the cards have spoken. The deeds of the day have been determined by destiny. I depart now and step with the decrees of fate. <sighs> that was Brent Jordan and Bo Wade once more experimenting with the parallel universes of one man, two parties. Christopher Lockhart is nothing if not willing to experiment. Next up, the experiment with Elaine Bouton, which I had the pleasure of directing. Elaine tells us she was kicked out of ballet at four years old for wanting to be the center of attention. In this piece, she is subject to a kind of attention nobody would want as the experiment. <laughs> Tell me where my face is. We can conclude this amicably. No monstrous rampages, no uh, abduction of innocents, no villagers storming the laboratory with torches and pitchforks. Well, you're gonna have to deal with me long before you have to deal with them. Ugh. A locked room keeps you safe. But also keeps you trapped. Thirst and hunger will force you out eventually. Return my face to me and I, I will simply enact justice, not revenge. Oh, enough babbling about your experiment. It is a folly fed by madness and engorged in garish masks. I don't care if the thesis department approves it. I will not participate in such outrage. So it is only left for me to choose one of these masks to 
there for the remainder of my life peering out from beneath? And the theory is that as the world sees me, so I also shall learn to see myself. Lunacy. And if I refuse to choose, do you really believe that Fine. Based on your data, and let us pray that it sates your insanity. But what if he's right? What if in choosing a face, I also choose a fate? Shall I choose to be the clown? The indefatigable purveyor of pratfalls and punchlines. I feel this is to be my fate already in my life to come. Why entomb my sorrow in a crypt of glee? Besides, that clown looks hungry. No doubt it also comes with the curse of carbohydrate craving. Give me a minute. This takes some time. Sheesh! What about a bestial appearance? Maybe it would best suit me. Free of reason and restraint. Free of the knowledge of once being human. Free of the memory of my humanity being stolen in an act grossly inhumane. Free of the company of a race that would perpetuate such cruelty upon one of its own. But no, though so I will have lost my human face, no doubt some part of me will long to look upon the face of humanity. It means I miss people! Except for you, you jerk. A fair face. Would it provide a fair life for someone treated so unfairly? Or would that be the most unbearable life of all? A life where within eventually seeps without. A life where my beauty, like a cool lake in a volcano's basin, inexorably seeps within the cracks in the bed below, dousing the fiery embers beneath it. Oh my God, it means that in looking like a nice person, it will lead me to be a nice person and to eventually forgiving you for being such a bad person. Did you not take a single humanity's requisite? I have chosen. If choice of my face, the choice of my fate, then I choose to acknowledge that I have no choice of either. For a person's fate is God alone's to choose. The face they wear at the end is but a memory, death mercifully leaves behind for her loved ones. The experiments ended. Okay, well. Oh, okay. All right, uh, then I'll just go. My face is in the staff room fridge. Excellent. Good luck with that dissertation. That was um, Elaine Bouton in The Experiment. So, um, one final piece this evening. Hell of a Poker Face brings together audience favorite Nathan Simmons, an Atlanta-based actor and most recently seen in two different sets of rules in our Uprisings event, 
with our theatrical super friends, Dano Waddell and Bo Wade, and the fresh face to the 3 by 3 series, Brent Jordan. And now, if you want to play with these guys, you'd better have a hell of a poker face. <coughs> Three of diamonds, nine of clubs, queen of clubs, and ten of hearts. Ah, uh, check. All right. This is one hand. Cam is not winning. Fifty is the bet, and zero are your chances. Call. Uh, I thought you were supposed to be good at math. Zero are your chances. X equals you're doomed. Y equals M-E can't lose. And Z equals you're bluffing. Uh, what the hell? You guys suck. And the last card is... Five of Diamonds. Um, 200. Hell of a poker face there, Brenny. I fold. What? You fold? Why? Well, because you hit your ace flush, you bastard. <laughs> you know, you're always chasing the ace flush, and congratulations, you finally caught it. Well, I might not have. I could be bluffing. Yeah, and you could have a double-pronged dick, but I'm still folding. Bifurcated. What? Bifurcated, branched into two. Bifurcated dick. <laughs> Shut up and fold. Fold. Oh, come on, guys. Brenny, you have the worst poker face in the world. Aborigines in Australia know that you hit your ace flush. So shut up and, take th and deal the next hand. Cam? What? Cam hasn't folded yet. Cam, what? Come on, wake up, man. Gawk at Brenny's stupidity on your own time. Stupidity? Stupidity. You called my bet when there was only like... Nine cards. Nine out of a possible... Forty. Forty? That could have helped you, which has like a... Twenty-two and a, and a half percent. A shit chance of happening. But I hit it. Okay, great. You hit it. So take your moron chips that you won with your moron cards and deal the next moron hand. Cam. What? Cam still hasn't folded. Cam, come on, for Christ's sake, fold already. Oh, Cam bets everything. What the? Can he do that? Yep, he just did. What in the? Oh, God. Okay. All right, I'll. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. <coughs> Fold? What? No, no, do not fold, you retard. You have the best hand. The best hand? Yes, the ace flush. You have the ace flush. He can't beat you. Except? Except? A except my sweet dimpled ass. You have the best possible hand. Uh, Call the bet. Philippe uh, keeps on saying except. Philippe, will you stop saying except for one goddamn second so that we can move on to the next hand? Except Brenny does not have the best hand. Ah, I don't have the best hand. See? I have to fold. Hey, you fold these cards and I will staple gun them to your sternum. Now, Philippe, would you mind explaining to me exactly what you were smoking? Three of diamonds, five of diamonds, seven of diamonds. Cam could be holding the four and the six. Of diamonds. Straight flush? Straight flush! Staple gun. Oh. You know that there is no chance in hell that Cam is holding the four six of diamonds. I didn't say he was. Okay. I just said that Brittany didn't have the best possible hand. I don't have the best hand. Yes, you do. What Philippe says! Okay, Philippe says that it's ten minutes to Wapner. Look, Brennan, Brennan, look at Cam. Does he look like uh, he's holding the straight flush? 
Well, does he look like he's holding the kick-ass, killer-diller hand from hell? He looks like, um... Does he look like he's about to take all of your money and blow it on broads and bourbon? No, he looks like... He looks like he's listening to one of my grandmother's Walmart stories. Exactly. Cam has got a poker face. Cam has got mad skills. Cam has got enough brains to not throw $50 into the pot while holding a four six of diamonds, knowing that there's like one card in the whole deck that could possibly let him win. Then why did he raise? To get you to throw your cards away. He's bluffing. Oh, I think he has it. What? The straight flush. I believe he has it. No, that is impossible. That is crazy talk. Cam would never play the 4-6 of diamonds. And there's no way he bet unless he did. <sighs> Tell him, Cam. You're bluffing. You don't got it, do you? You do have it, Cam. Don't you? Don't you? Damn, that is a hell of a poker face. <laughs> no, oh, God. Okay, guys, what do you want me to do? Call. Fold. Call. Fold. Philippe, why would Cam play such lousy cards? Perhaps. Perhaps because that's exactly the last thing we'd expect from him. Of course it's the last thing that we'd expect. They are suck-ass cards. I, 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 it, Cam would not play the four six of diamonds. The, the only thing that Cam was doing was trying to uh, prove that Brenny is such a pussy by pushing him right off the deck. Hey, I'm sitting right here. Hey, listen, but Brenny wasn't going to fold until I mentioned the possibilities of the straight flush. Brenny was going to call, thinking he had the best hand. Mm -hmm. See, Cam, he was banking on Brenny's ignorance. I am right here. Cam was banking on uh, winning with his pair of queens or whatever the hell he's holding. When Brenny hit his ace flush, Cam figured he'd bully short skirt here right off the pot. You can't bluff someone who thinks they have the best hand. The only thing that's possible that makes any kind of sense is if Cam has the four and the six. Cam never plays bad cards. Maybe that's the point. We think Cam only plays well. He wants to show us something different. What, that he can play lousy? No, no, no. See, no one likes to be categorized, to be labeled. Okay, so he's sick of us thinking that he's a good player. <laughs> that is the stupidest thing that I have ever heard. I mean, it just... Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. What Cam is sick of is ass in the dark players like Brenny, who will uh, steal his chips with blind luck. So his plan is to uh, bluff Brenny black and blue until the boy gets some sense into his head. See, you paint Cam as some god raining down thunderbolts on the unworthy. You see, that's exactly what he's trying to break free of. I mean, Mo, look at him. Head hanging low, shoulders all slumped, expectations weighing on him. I mean, listen, look at this man. I mean, we treat him like he's someone apart, aloft. He just wants to rejoin us, come down to our level. You know, come and be friends with us again. Not patsies. Look at him. Look. Oh, I'm looking right at him. Right in his eyes. They're like angry, flashing lasers trying to burn a hole through Brenny's skull. And his lips trying to keep from pulling back into a vicious sneer. And that vein on his forehead pounding like a jungle drum. Brenny. I hate you, Brenny. I hate you, Brenny. I hate you. Really? It's saying that? Mo, you have to think of Cam's family. Oh, do they hate Brenny too? 
No. Cam's family. That's what you have to understand about Cam. See, we both know his father. Cold, demanding. Cam could never live up to his expectations. And his mother just smothered him. She tried to prevent him from every single imaginable hurt. See, what Cam is seeking right now is what he didn't seek from his parents, which is a true human connection. Aww, Cam, that is so... That is so, such a crusty crock of crap. Think. He thought he finally had a chance to connect with us. We're his friends, okay? But then he realizes that his natural talent has blocked him from us. So he must shed that talent so that he can draw us near. Yeah, near enough to kick us in the nuts. Look, I've known Cam's family since grade school. Sure, his father is a prick, but that's exactly where Cam learned it from. Every prick trick of the trade. And his mother, my God, where would Cam be without his mother? Oh, my boy would never steal lunchboxes like that. My boy would never set a math book on fire like that. My boy would, would never tie another boy upside down to the top of the monkey bars like that. He left me up there till seventh period. Cam has had the perfect training and the perfect encouragement to become the cruel, heartless, poker-ruling bastard that he is today. If he has to get up out of that chair and beat Brenny's head into a month old pumpkin to prove that he's still top dog, he will. He's hurting. No, he is a monster. But what's he got? Brenny, trust me. Fold your hand. And I'm telling you, you got him by the balls, right in your hand. Squeeze. Just give me a minute. Give me a minute. Got to get this all straight. So you're saying if Cam is a lonely, sad little boy who wants nothing more in this world but to be held while he sobs all his pain away, he has the straight flush, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. And if Cam is a sadistic, prowling beast whose only pleasure is causing his best friends to writhe in pain, then he doesn't have a straight flush. Exactly. Hmm. Wow. All these years, all these years, and we'll finally understand. Oh, that's worth the money. Easy. <laughs> I call. All right, Cam. Let's see what you got. So, do I win? Yep. Looks like. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think I'm finally figuring this game out. <laughs> I'll get a new deck. It's my turn to deal. Thank you. That was Nathan Simmons, Bo Wade, Brent Jordan, Dano Waddell in Hell of a Poker Face. Thank you so much for join us, joining us in our ongoing online theater challenge. Let's bring everybody back for a curtain call. If you join tonight's, if you enjoy tonight's experiment, please do three things. Follow us on Facebook, Rough Magic Shakespeare Company, to be the first to hear about new events or submit prompts to dare our playwrights to rise to our challenge. If you are an actor, director, or playwright and would like to get involved, message us. We'd love to hear from you. Everybody, check out our YouTube channel where you can re relive all our explorations and share them with your 
unfortunate friends who haven't joined the fun yet, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And click the bell when you subscribe for notifications. Every subscriber gets us closer to our sponsorship goal. And if you can, donate at paypal.me slash roughmagicshakes. You can find the link on our Facebook posts and in the description of every YouTube video. Every dollar is cherished. Thank you again for entering into our theatrical experimentations. And remember everybody, save live theater. Save, save the world. world. Oh.